Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. We have nine yeses for absence. Great. Did we have any other uh, members join us since the roll call? I think we, we went uh, from eight to nine and with um, Todd um, Campbell Mr. joining. Mr. Campbell. Do we have any others join? Just want to make sure we didn't miss anyone. Okay. Great. No. Move on to the uh, discussion item number three. And Mr. Alatori, you want to review and follow up on action items? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Rodriguez. The first action item was uh, inform Mr. Lamar whether a presentation on the old engine scrapping will be placed on the future agenda. And yes, we're working with CARB to uh, give a presentation on that. Second action item was provide an update on potential reinstatement of Home Rule Advisory Group. Spoke to Wayne uh, yesterday, and he is going to have that conversation with uh, Chair Benoit uh, in the very near future. So hopefully at the next meeting, I'll be able to give an update on that. That's it. Okay. Uh, do we have any public comment? None? None. Okay. I'll close the public comment and ask for any um, input or questions from fellow um, advisory group members. I don't see any raised hands. Okay, no motion is required. So we'll, we'll move on to item four, uh, which is uh, information on the ultraviolet electron beam light emitting uh, diode technology in printing and industrial applications in UVC for air filtration. We have uh, representatives from RadTech International and IUVA will provide uh, information to us today. Thank you for joining us and we'll look forward to your presentation and then we'll take any public comment. Take it away. Thank you. Hi, we'll we start with Mike Ida Cavage. Mike, are you there? I see hey, yes. you. Yes, I am. I was uh, unfortunately uh, accidentally back to being muted. So sorry for the, the drop. So no problem. Go ahead. Okay. And am I able to uh, advance these slides or should I just have whoever's controlling it advance? The staff just want to uh, have... Um, just uh, say uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Sounds okay, good. perfect. Thank you. Thank that, you. that would work well. Anyway, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Ida-Cavage, and I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, a very short uh, overview of UV and EB curing of coatings, inks, uh, and uh, 3D objects, adhesives, and so forth. So with that, next slide, please. You, oh, one more back. Yes, thank you. Um, there are quite a lot of energy curable applications out there. You're exposed to them literally every day. If you've driven in a car uh, in the last few days, uh, you may be surprised how many parts are, uh, are there on that automo automobile uh, as a result of UV curing. 99 plus percent of headlamps on all cars and trucks are coated with a UV curable or energy curable coating. In wood flooring, most uh, vinyl flooring is coated with UV curable uh, chemistry. Uh, wood coating cabinets, all that uh, is very large uh, opportunity for UV curable coatings. Even as you see on the slide here on the left-hand side, uh, teeth and, and gums, this is a, an actual photo from a project that I'm currently supporting. Uh, and that's printing um, dental uh, appliances. So teeth, gums that are permanent using UV curable chemistry, the exact same chemistry that I'll be talking uh, about this morning. Next slide. Moving from what we call industrial applications, uh, perhaps in the Americas, so the United States, the largest single application is in the graphic arts or printing. Um, on the upper left, you see a, a printing press, which is a flexo press, which has the capability for UV curable coating uh, and inks. And in this case, pretty much every printing press that has been made in the past oh, 15 plus years has the capability of using UV curable inks. On the bottom right, you see a variety of packaging. If you walk through your local Vons, Albertsons, 
Ralph's and so forth, pretty much every package you see has been cured by a UV curable ink. Um, and I, later in this presentation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be describing some of the reasons why it pretty much dominates uh, the printing industry now for packaging. But it is also can be used in, it's used in electronics, um, even some simple as the, the graphic arts on the motorcycle helmet. Next slide, please. There's a really wide range and one or two or even three slides wouldn't do it justice, but this gives a very quick snapshot of where the uh, UV curable uh, inks and electron beam inks are used in coatings. You have industrial applications like wood furniture, I've mentioned those, coatings on plastic, metal, 3D printing or additive manufacturing. One of the uh, largest companies uh, that has really gained a lot of press in 3D printing uses UV curable uh, systems, UV curable chemistry, and it's located in California, and that's uh, carbon up in the Bay Area. But you also have inks, overprint varnishes, flexo inks, screen print, litho, uh, laminating pressure sensitive adhesives, and the list could go on and on. Next slide. But what is UV or EB curing and, and, and why does it make such a large impact? Um, it is basically just using UV energy or, or visible light or low energy electrons. Uh, and this is similar to what you would see in, on the old style uh, cathode ray tubes or cathode CRT type screens, TV screens, as opposed to using heat or evaporative or oxidative air dry type curing to form your coating film or ink. And it's usually uh, for UV, it's between 200 to 400 nanometers. So a specific wavelength of light uh, or visible light or electron beam. However, by far the most common usage is UV uh, energy. Next slide. So what is the UV curing process? Here's an interesting comparison because everybody is familiar with conventional cure. And this is basically you apply your, your, uh, your ink or coating in a wet application, and it's a certain, certain thickness. It then goes into the drying stage. So this is most often an, an oven system. You remove your solvent, either organic solvent or water. And what happens is that the coating starts to shrink as you're removing the solvent and drying time could be seconds, minutes, long as hours in some coatings. And you end up with your dry film and the properties develop over time. What UV curing is, or electron beam curing is, is exact same wet application. You apply it the same way you apply a conventional cure. However, instead of going through an oven, in this case, you would expose it very briefly to UV light. Um, you get pretty much instantaneous cure in, in the order of milliseconds. And because there's no, typically no organic solvents or no water in there, it doesn't shrink. You keep the same thickness and you get immediate property development. You get what's called high cross-link density. So it becomes very tough and retains its shape in the dry film. Next slide. So why is energy curing uh, used so often? The principal reason why companies go to this is productivity or productivity or productivity. To get seconds to cure instead of minutes or hours to get your part is extremely valuable. You can get very high throughput. The, it's usually a lower overall cost per cure part because you're not you wasting a solvent in there that has to be removed. You get fast cure speed, saves time, and you can recycle the coatings, uh, the liquid coatings before it's cured. These are usually single component formulations. You don't have to mix things. If people have mixed two part epoxies would, would, would understand that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, greatly reduces mixing errors. It has it alleviates a lot of uh, regulatory concerns because it, it significantly lowers the VOC emissions because you tend to avoid the use of an organic solvent, which has to be uh, either captured or burnt. It has a smaller equipment footprint. It uses less floor space. You don't have large ovens. Uh, one project that I was involved in a few years ago was able to reduce uh, ovens, which were literally uh, 60, 70 yards long, um, to something that was only 20 feet. So, so a significant space savings and allowed that company to expand. And of course, especially nowadays, unfortunately, uh, it reduces energy costs when you're just curing something by a few lamps 
versus uh, an oven. Uh, and this is especially uh, is true when uh, periods of high oil prices. Next slide. When you're using UV curing or electron beam curing, you're not just curing a single material, you're, you're curing a formulation, a mixture, just like you have paints or inks or anything else uh, that, that uh, you're making. Uh, and in this case, and I have the uh, this uh, formulation uh, pyramid up on the screen, um, in, in a conventional cure, you would have what is listed here as a ligamer is, is whatever is adding to your paint, I'm going to use a paint as an example, to give its properties. Then you have a, a, a solvent. And instead of using solvent, we're now using monomers. So think of it as replacing organic solvents in water with what's called a reactive diluent, reactive solvent that reacts in with your coating. So that's, that's, that's a, the key, one of the key differences here. And the additives and initiators is what actually starts the reaction after its exposure to uh, UV light. Next slide. With the ability to, to change the monomer, the oligomer, the different components here, you can get a really wide range of properties. Um, some of the desired properties that are, that are achieved through formulating, you get uh, good adhesion, you can change the speed, you can change the scratch and abrasion resistance. You get good weatherability that could so it could withstand sitting out in the uh, in the California sun. You could also pigment the system. So, and this is the list can go on and on. You can you can really fine tune your application, whether you're making an ink or a paint or an adhesive or your 3D printing. So it's it's really versatile uh, chemistry. Next slide, please. You have different light sources. I, I know I, up to now I've been talking about the chemistry that's commonly used. But there's also a, a range of, of uh, light sources for that UV lamp. What I have here on the screen, the arc and microwave are variations of what you'd known as a mercury lamps uh, on there, with the exception of the filling that's used in that lamp, and they look like mercury lamps, uh, is such so that when they are excited, either through um, electrical discharge or a microwave system, instead of seeing visible light, you get UV energy out. You could have something called pulse xenon lamps. These are, this is a, really a very small part of the industry, but what's dramatically growing are UV LEDs. So these are light emitting diodes, very similar to what you can go to your local uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and get an LED lamp uh, or light. In this case, that lamp is engineered to not uh, give out visible lamp, visible light, but UV energy. So you have a, a safer, more uh, usually easy control, easily controllable source for that UV land, UV energy. Next slide, please. And so, what does this equipment look like? Uh, it is commonly, and it can be a wide range of how it's, these lamps are used. And in the upper left, you see something that I've listed as it called a belt unit. It's basically a conveyor, and the box that's sitting on top of that unit contains your uh, either your UV mercury lamps or your UV LED lamps. And so what most companies do, and, and, and again, this is can exist even as a small unit like here, and this is a commercial unit, just something that could be quite large. Um, that basically your part is coated or printed. It's put on the conveyor belt. It goes through the unit and it's completely dry by the time it gets to the end. And you can get some very fast speeds, maybe up to, um, 1,200, 1,600 feet per minute, depending on how thick you want your coating in. So you get very good uh, productivity. Uh, it could be on, attached to printers. So uh, whether it's, I showed a Flexoplast earlier, here's a screen printer, or even as something as uh, unique as this uh, field applied curing unit. I kind of uh, tend to call this a, a miniature uh, Zamboni machine for those of you who've uh, been to hockey games. And it's basically a UV lamp inside this machine, it's pushed along and the UV formulation comes out, it coats the floor and the, and the operator can immediately walk on it uh, after, it's, after it's cured, after you push it. So at a regular walking pace, and uh, this has been used at some very large warehouse stores where instead of having to close down the warehouse for two days to, coat, to strip the epoxy coating, put the, a new epoxy coating on and wait for it to cure, this can be uh, a floor can be coated just in a few hours. Next slide, please. 
they mentioned earlier on about ink uh, in graphic arts are very common use and um, very likely in California, this is going to be the most common use of UV curable materials because in the Americas and especially in the United States, uh, the vast majority of applications are graphic arts or printing. So why have printing has gone over to UV curing versus what has been done since Gutenberg time? Um, and and it could be, you could see this here uh, clearly on the chart. So let's take the first one, it's solvent-based. So this is traditional inks that has an organic solvent in there. Um, that it has some of the advantages are very high press speeds, you get good print quality. And because it's been used for years and years, a lot of good experience. However, you get retained volatiles or, 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 or uh, VOCs. So you have to, your solvent choice affects your adhesion. You have ink stability problems and blocking, which is pr uh, print sticking to each other after it gets off the press because it takes a certain time to dry. So a move has gone, gone over to water-based inks. Here you have better ink cost, lower cost, and lower retained solvents. But then you run into usually typical, some challenges using those inks. You can get low chemical resistance. Um, for example, spilled uh, an alcohol or a nail polish. You have drying requirements because you have to remove that water. And you can also get blocking problems. But when you see energy or UV curing inks, you get low to no volatiles. You get usually excellent print quality, which is one of the driving forces for all those packages you see in Albertsons. Uh, you get good chemical resistance, low waste, good stability, and instant drying. The downside is that the cost per se pound, the ink is usually a little bit higher because it uh, takes a, a little bit more refined chemistry to do that. The capital cost, if you don't have those uh, lamps on your press, and sometimes press speed, depending on what you're trying to do. But overall, this is what's driving uh, most printers switching over to a UV curable ink. Next slide. And some of the substrates or, or surfaces that you get um, UV curable inks used on uh, are, are really a, a, are varied. You have polyester you get for coffee pouches, uh, carrier bags, frozen food bags are, are printed with UV ink, snack food bags, drink labels, sausage casings. Um, you can get yogurt lids, uh, barrier tubing for poultry, and, and of course, metalized film so a lot of snack foods, confectionery, are printed with UV inks. So they're, uh, again, like I just want to stress that they're the majority of the printed market now. Next slide. And this will be my, uh, my final slide. I'll, I'll wrap it up here. And that's to go to what uh, uh, an OPV printing, which is overprint varnishes. This is the single most popular use of UV curable inks or graphic art coatings uh, in the market. Over 50% of all UV printing is OPV applications. And what an OPV is, is, is a relatively thin coating over an ink or substrate. So when you get your magazine um, and you have a glossy coating or the advertisements that you get in the mail and they're, and they're nice and shiny or they're uh, mixed where you have a shiny and matte surface, that's done by a, a UV curable OPV. Um, this provides a gloss or a matte effect. It protects the printing to prevent a, the, the ink from rubbing off in your hands. It's uh, used as a non-yellowing uh, coating. You may get special effects by adding pearlescent type materials in that OPV. Uh, again, very, very big in, uh, in uh, the marketing aspects. And finally, you can get ease in processing. You get scuff resistance, anti-slip, or slip, depending on what you're trying to engineer. So even if the inks are used for UV cure coating, almost always they have a clear coating over that for protection. So the, the, the market uh, in graphics arts is, 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 is just extremely large uh, for this effect. And with that, I'd like to uh, end my, uh, my short presentation here at next slide. And this is, should be the end. Yes, it's the end. And I wanna thank you so much for your, your attention. Over, uh, over to you, Rita. I Thanks think we your... have Troy, Mr. Chair, um, for a uh, brief part two. And I believe you wanted to hold questions until the very end of the item. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so just to clarify, if we have a uh, first, thank you for that last presentation. And we'll hold questions until we have uh, uh, the following 
presentation and we'll take uh, some public comments and then open it up to uh, any and all questions and comments. So please proceed if you have a, another uh, coinciding presentation. Chair, Chair Robert, just, I don't believe we're proceeding with the second presentation because that seems to be medical uses, disinfection uses of UV light, which is not within the South Coast HMD jurisdiction. Hmm. Okay, so uh, would we, we not have clarity coming into today's meeting on uh, whether or not we're just doing one presentation? I Let me just uh, hold the comments for a second, Rita. And was that uh, from Derek, you want to clarify, was, was there any other presentation today that we had scheduled on uh, item four? Well, I'm not sure, Rita. I know there was going to be two people presenting and then we got those additional seven slides that I responded back to you that we weren't going to be able to um, show today. So is the second person giving, just adding on to um, what the previous presenter gave, or is it those oh, seven slides that yeah. he was going to present on? He's not going to do the, the slides. And um, basically, this presentation was agendized and uh, Troy Cowan is on the agenda for part two on UVC air filtration. And this is um, in relation to the AB 617 mission of the committee um, for uh, specifically for uh, schools uh, and air filtration supplementation uh, to schools. He originally had some slides that did mention healthcare. They were for um, only for reference, but the point of this presentation is the air filtration component, uh, which is in line with the AB 617. So we thought that we would withhold the slides since uh, staff had concerns with the Brown Act originally uh, for the timing of the slides. So we would agree to uh, withhold the slides and we would um, just focus on the uh, very brief presentation which is another application of UV technology for disinfection systems. We thought that would be um, interesting to the committee, as I had mentioned before, uh, in light of the VOC reduction uh, from specifically hand sanitizing and increase in um, chemical disinfection, which this process replaces that. Uh, so from the consumer products aspect, from the uh, indoor air quality aspect, uh, we think it's totally in line with the mission of the district um, and the committee as well. Uh, I'm going to, can we defer uh, Daphne? I think that's fine, right? I mean, if you're saying that it's related to school filtration and that's something that you've discussed in the AB 617 context, I think it would be appropriate. Uh, I would be. Uh, comfortable proceeding with the presentation if there aren't any um, other matters for staff to consider. Mr. Alatori, I don't have any more slides left. Okay, yeah, I think it's just going to be verbal. Okay. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and proceed with Mr. Cowan. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for having me and allowing me to speak. And thank you, council members and, and distinguished guests. Uh, I'm here representing the International UV Association, about 800 members, 40 countries. Uh, specifically, I'm part of the Healthcare Working Group, which is 140 of those members, 14 countries. And we, we specifically uh, look at things related to indoor air quality and their health effects on the general, general public. I'm, when I talk about ultraviolet light here, I'm talking about the part of the ultraviolet spectrum that has germicidal qualities, which is typically from 200 to 280 nanometers in wavelength. That's very specific because that's part of the UV spectrum that does not cause permanent damage to human skin or eyes like UVB does, what we get from the sun that causes the sunburn and melanoma and all that stuff. UVC is of a different quality, but it's the stuff that kills pathogens. And I misspoke. 
It doesn't kill pathogens, it inactivates pathogens. It penetrates into the DNA of the bad bugs and disrupts the DNA so that the pathogens cannot reproduce. And it addresses everything from viruses, SARS-CoV-2, flu, measles, TB, tuberculosis, all the way down to uh, the uh, stuff that causes healthcare acquired infections, C. diff, MRSA, VRE, all the way down to Legionnaire's disease, which those involved in water treatment are very well aware of uh, the use of UV to treat UV ducts to prevent Legionnaires. Um, most recently, UVC, germicidal UV, has come into the forefront as a preventative, as a way to clean the air better when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, the bad bug that kills COVID-19, that causes COVID-19. There have been two recent things which you may be aware of. There was a February 1st article in Time Magazine, which did a very good comprehensive job of indoor air Air Quality World Health Organization back on December 17th, which spoke very specifically to the advantages of using germicidal UV for air treatment to um, improve indoor air quality and reduce the chances of indoor transmission of SARS-CoV-2. What what that presentation speaks to primarily is the use of what's called upper air UVC, which is essentially shining UV lights across the top of the ceiling. So it doesn't shine down on the people sitting in the room, it shines across the top and it treats all the air in the ceiling region. And when it does that, it actually does it about 10 times more efficiently than treating it in the ducts or through a standalone air filtration units, primarily because it's treating so much more air at one time. The, uh, the benefits of using UV for air treatment in this way, you obviously have less of a risk of spreading the airborne pathogens. We're talking SARS-CoV-2, we're talking flu, we're talking measles, we're talking TB. Any of those airborne diseases are reduced, the, uh, the chances of getting them are reduced through use of upper air UVC. There are studies underway right now in South Africa to address uh, absenteeism in schools, et cetera. Um, the, the other thing, it's easy to implement. It's just like installing a light fixture. So these, these points are made in the slides, which will be posted later through our IUVA website. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that information. And uh, I'll ask staff if we have any uh, public comments on today's item four. So there are two, looks like. And um, first one is says admin. I don't know who admin is. And the second one is Harvey Yetter. Okay, let's take the first and see if that's uh, a requested um, public comment or not. Or is that uh, Supervisor uh, Rutherford's number? So this is admin, I'm not sure. Because your hand is raised also. Super oh, no, it's not. I see it's different. What's the phone number we have? There's no phone number, just says admin. That's all okay. it says. So we're going to wait a moment and see if, uh, if, if you've made a request to make a public comment and there's a... Um, affiliation with the term admin to your account? Are you 
wanting to make a public comment. So we have you in the queue. Their mic is muted right now. They can unmute their mic by, is it star nine or star six? Star six. Star six. Okay. You want to push star six again if you are in the queue and you had intended to make a public comment. Okay, why don't we come back to that uh, request? Perhaps they're having some technical issues and we'll give them another opportunity to see if they can come online. If not, um, well, let's go ahead and proceed with uh, our next public comment. Uh, Har Mr. Harvey Edder. Or Mr. Harvey Edder. Uh, hello, am, am I being heard? Good afternoon, Harvey. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. No. My name is Harvey Edder. I'm speaking for myself and for the public of the Power Coalition. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Luff, uh, the leader, for bringing this to us. It's good to know about new technology and what's up. We're looking for a you know, dialogue, blog, and interaction. We're innovators and have been from the uh, invention of the skew board in the early 50s. Living Christmas tree, the, uh, the aluminum can, solar collector, etc. Anyway, um, uh, so th this is this is good to, to see and good to get out there. And we're we're looking at, at at trying to get vertically and horizontally integrated companies, also worker owned and controlled companies. Uh, and that's why we like to work with with small businesses in the industry and integrating that. We brought that up in the past. So I'm concerned. Also, if there's anybody that can give me a number of HEPA filters, this versus what you're talking about, the upper part, you know, treating uh, that were, you know, in, what is the cost and the, the efficacy? I'm sorry, I'm outside, and this is the real world. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so uh, there's a big push, you know, with COVID and what in the schools for HEPA filters, other places. If there are any numbers on that, I should any ballparks that you like to do. All right, thank you. Bye. comments right now if anybody can, if, we, if you could respond or somebody who uh, no mr Edder, why don't you please finish your you have another minute and 20 seconds and then we'll uh, uh i'll, I'll, I'll reserve it for for further comments and then say that three minutes should be granted on on each item for public comments I, there has been some support support for that anyway uh, it's enough that for i want to reserve time so let's take up don't don't waste their time. <laughs> well, I want to make sure we're not cutting you off. Was that concluding okay, your public comments? I'm reserving comments? my time. I, you know, I'm apparently having a difficult time expressing that. I want to be able to speak on other items, and I think I'm being, you know, having my rights taken away anyway because you should get three minutes on each item, and that's the way the law is. Anyway, we'll litigate further. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Edder. Appreciate it. Let's go back to the previous request and see if we had any luck. Uh, connecting that person or if they had any intention in the first place to make a public comment. Staff, do we have any clarity on that? I was, uh, if not, I'm going to go ahead and move off a of public comment unless you uh, tell me otherwise. I'm ready to start six again. Jason, uh, Jason, did, did you want to say anything? Jason Aspel, sorry. I don't have any comments at this time, Derek. Thank you. Okay. Any clarification from staff on whether or not we have any other public comment? One, one more person, um, okay. still the admin person, and their mic is muted. There it goes. It's, well, I wasn't muted. Nope. There it goes. It's unmuted now. Okay. <clears throat> uh, can you? hear us and would you like to make a public comment and if so could you introduce yourself so it's somebody on sca qmd pw so i don't know they're junior can you hear me yes yes that's i think that's me i'm on uh i'm listening I'm here. I'm just not showing up on the screen. That's all. This is Paul Avila. All right, Paul. 
We'll meet you. Thank you. Okay, the mystery solved. Do we have any other public comment? Uh, no, but we just have Supervisor Rutherford's hand is up. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment, and then we'll move uh, on to any comments from uh, starting with Supervisor Rutherford, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rita, I appreciated the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing those guests to educate us because it's a topic that keeps coming up over and over again. I wanted to go back, if we could, to the slideshow. There was uh, one slide that showed uh, the different uses. It was bullet points down the left-hand side. Keep going. Keep going. More. There we go. Um, on bullet point number four, the regulatory concerns, VOC emission, avoid solvent use in most cases. I think this is the one where we're getting hung up when we have board interactions with staff over potential regulations because staff uh, hangs on that in most cases and says, well, there could be VOC emissions and so we have to measure. And so I, I, I wanted to ask you to address that and ask staff to address that and see if you can help us really focus in on, on what that distinction is. Mr. Chair, may I respond? Is, was that yes, the Supervisor go. Rutherford? Yes. Go ahead. So, That's a question for you. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, first of all, I wanted to thank the uh, both gentlemen who presented and also wanted to thank uh, Bill Lamar uh, because this was uh, one of his ideas. They have a presentation to show the state of uh, UV and EV uh, curing technology. Um, on the regulatory concerns, uh, because we're global, we will never make a claim that, you know, 100% of every coding that has ever been made uh, will be zero VOC. Uh, so what we've agreed to do is to put in limits in rules um, that specify a VOC content less than 50 grams per liter. And that uh, gives the district the certainty that they need. Um, now, I know that uh, there have been comments uh, regarding quote unquote solvent uh, UV systems. Those are really uh, unique systems and they're not conventional UV. Uh, what uh, we are seeing end users do is they have brought in a photo initiator and added it to their existing solvent system. Um, and then they put in a UV unit to cure that. So it's really two separate things. Um, and the solvent system is regulated uh, with all the bells and whistles already um, for a conventional solvent system. The UV portion of that material, which is just a photo initiator, does not have the VOCs. So I hope that helps um, address that. And, and thank you for the question. And, and so I'd like if we have staff here who can respond to that, because staff just seems to have a different take on it than that. And we keep getting in this endless loop over it. So, so this is uh, Mike Morris playing rules manager. And um, I, I think to, to respond to Rita, um, you know, she does make a point about the, the solvent systems and how we do have appropriate regulations for that. I think the, the issue that came up in the previous uh, Rule 1115 uh, meeting was that there was a request for a full exemption for all UV products. Um, and and you know, that would take away our ability to make sure that we don't have those types of solvent systems utilized. Uh, and that, that was our pushback for um, that full exemption request. They, they, you know, there are systems that do have VOC, whether they're within the, the coding system themselves or the cleanup process. And so we want to keep those uh, properly regulated, uh, whereas, you know, in general, the typical type of products, they usually do have low VOC. But didn't Rita just say those are regulated? Yes, but the request was to take away that regulation. That was the, the number one request for that letter that was provided to us on Rule 1115. And we're back into the endless loop. But thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. 
<laughs> and I just wanted to clarify, we're comfortable taking a limit of 50 grams per liter. That's not an issue. We, uh, we do not uh, support uh, solvent systems being unregulated. So we're on the same page with staff as that. We never have. And then supervisor, if you don't mind, I could uh, uh, present it from the permitting side, if you don't mind. Um, so Jason Aspel, uh, Deputy Executive Officer of our Engineering and Permitting. Uh, so from a VOC perspective, uh, you know, when, when we receive a permit application, uh, we, we look at not necessarily the technology, but the VOC content of the coding, which there are exemptions for certain low uh, VOC content coatings, um, but then also the other side of that is the total overall VOC emissions. And in that first bullet point on that slide you presented, it was the productivity is faster cure times and potentially uh, more usage of coatings at that point. So um, in, in some cases where uh, Rito talked about the photo initiator, uh, it does allow for faster production, more production, and uh, that is something we would be looking at is ensuring that facilities continued to comply with their permit limits um, to ensure they didn't trigger any uh, emission offset requirements uh, or, or, or anything like that. So uh, two, two different um, concerns or aspects from the permitting perspective. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for starting off the uh, dialogue supervisor and wanted to ask if um, any other colleagues have uh, questions or comments on any of the uh, presentations today. Mr. Lamar has a question. His hand is raised. Okay. Please go ahead, Bill. Oh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I had my hand up there for a while. Uh, no, I just wanted to, uh, to, to clarify. I, I, it may not even be necessary, but uh, to Supervisor Rutherford's point, uh, there, there's more than one photo initiator. There, there are many, many photo initiators, and they're not all created equally. Uh, it's the toxicological properties of the photo initiators that I think has has the staff concerned. Uh, and uh, and I was glad to hear that uh, that Rita, on behalf of RadTech, uh, uh, agree, agree to that. So that that's that's one of their uh, one of their main issues, I think, as far as uh, the, the permitting issue issue goes. Sounds like that was a comment more than a question. Was there a question in there, Bill? No, I I, I didn't I didn't have I didn't have a question. I, I was making a comment. Okay. Uh, I, I did I did have a. I, I did have another comment, and it might be, be a question too. Uh, and I think it was slide 12 uh, of, of the presentation uh, on energy uh, for energy cured uh, uh, energy cured ink types, ink cost, capital cost, uh, uh, reactivity speed, and uh, there was a. Uh, I, I think the uh, the presenter. Talked about uh, printing has, has uh, that these were the reasons that uh, printing has gone over to UV. Uh, I've been working with the printing industries for uh, about 30, almost 35 years. And uh, the, the, the real change in that industry has been to xerography. Uh, you, uh, if, if you look at the market these days, there's really not much of a market for used presses or even news news presses. Uh, your 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 local uh, uh, UPS store uh, <clears throat> or for FedEx stores used to be Kinkos. Uh, you don't see a press press in, in in those any longer. It's all xerography, so it's it's gone it's gone to that. Uh, uh, where you do see, where you do see the uh, the differences in the large print plants uh, for offset, heat set, wide web, uh, which I believe is still a challenge for for UV. Uh, only the, the, their primary market would be narrow web and mid web. 
so uh, as, as long as as long as we're seeing that that uh, that the industry uh, shop owners business owners have a choice and it's not uh, it's not it's not one that is regulation or no regulation we're fine with this so thank you uh, thank you for your insights and comments. Any other uh, questions from the advisory group for Rita or the presenters? Okay. Rita has a comment. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, go ahead Rita. I was going to uh, follow up with a few questions, but go right ahead. Yes. I, I just wanted to touch on the uh, point that uh, bill raised regarding uh, potential toxics. And, you know, we've heard that concern from the staff in the past in the um, entire time that I've been working with this industry, I have not seen a coating, at least the ones that come across my desk that has any toxic air contaminants, um, or hazardous air pollutants. That's one of our selling points. However, our association's position is that in the unlikely event that such a coating uh, would come up that would contain toxic, toxics, uh, we do not support uh, exemptions for those materials. And so we fully support the full force of regulation on toxic air contaminants. And as a matter of fact, Rule 1401 uh, does have safeguards for that. And it specifically says any material that contains any um, toxic air contaminant is by default not exempted from permitting. Uh, so yeah, we don't we don't support um, exemptions for toxic air contaminants. We don't support uh, exemptions for UV and EV materials that would be um, potentially containing a solvent. Thank you. Okay, and to your previous point, Rita, you had mentioned that um, as far as exemptions on UV products, there was a, a certain threshold uh, limit. What was that again? 50 grams per liter, which is basically the standard district definition of super compliant material in most rules. Okay, so from the standpoint of uh, Jason and um, the permitting, how does that uh, 50 grams per liter on uh, as a threshold for UV products in relation to um, a, a threshold for exemptions or non-exemptions. Uh, what, what staff reaction to that? Because I, I am also mindful of the supervisor's comment about uh, the endless loop. So I'm trying to really get a sense of where the point of uh, contention is for the loop. Right, yeah. So again, uh, it's it's those same two aspects I, I was mentioning. Thank you for the question, Mayor. Um, but it's, the VOC content, which is low, um, which is you know something we would encourage uh, facilities to use uh, low VOC coatings. Uh, that is one part of the exemption. Another is how much they use of that coating. So we do have exemptions uh, if uh, a facility were use over six gallons uh, per day, um, then that would exceed our uh, permit exemption uh, threshold as well. And the uh, reasoning behind that is at that point, the overall VOC emissions um, um, become a factor, not just the coating itself. So if I may, this is Susan Nakamura. I uh, just wanted to um, add, there, there have been uh, kind of two uh, main themes that we've heard from uh, RADTAC in the past. Uh, one is in regards to permitting and, and the other is looking at exemptions for UVEB. And so uh, I think Rita uh, highlighted it's like that, uh, the evaluation under rule 1401. And that evaluation comes because uh, we're looking at the particular material and the, the use of it uh, through permitting. So if it is exempted, in permitting, then we don't have that opportunity to look at uh, the materials that they're using. Um, back in 2014, the issue of UVEB for uh, Rule 1130 for graphic arts came up and we did look at those inks and coatings and cleanup solvents that were used. 
And there were um, inks, coatings, and solvents that were used that were above 50 grams per liter. Um, so I think it, it, we, we do want to be very careful. We do support the curable technology of UVEB LED, uh, but the concern for us is uh, in regards to the inks, coatings, and solvents that are being used and the uh, potential for toxicity as well as the VOC content. So the technology, uh, Susan, I'm hearing you, you're supportive of the solvents, inks, coatings, and solvents. That's um, the concern and the amount. Correct. Uh, and so that, um, to Jason's earlier point, right now, the threshold for an exemption is six gallons per day on a, on a variety of these um, inks, coatings, and solvents then as, as to um, being able to secure an exemption? Yeah, I, I believe we have already incorporated a number of exemptions uh, on the permitting side uh, for uh, looking at a combination of VOC content and the usage in that, uh, so it doesn't go over the one pound per day threshold that we generally use for permitting. Um, so it's like, this is, uh, it's not an old topic and it's one that, you know, we try to look at, you know, every area that we can, uh, you know, provide, uh, some flexibility, uh, for, the, for that industry, but we also need to be sure that we're not going backwards. And then we also want to make sure that we're uh, being fair to other folks that are using, uh, coatings and solvents that have the same VOC limit that we're, um, providing limits for. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Susan. You said it's not an old uh, topic. Not is, not is, is that topic um, been at a uh, committee recently? It, Which one? Uh, so it was discussed in stationary source when we um, amended rule 219 for mobile refueling and it came up there. And then, so we're going to go back again to look at rule 219. Um, it comes up in almost every VOC uh, rule uh, that we, um, if we amend or adopt. So it came up most re recently in rule 1115. Uh, and so when that rule came to stationary, the, the topic came up. Um, but I, I think, uh, Mary, you hit the you hit it perfectly in regards to the tech, the UV curable technology and the difference between the uh, inks, coatings and solvents that they're using that just because you're using a UV curable technology doesn't mean that the coatings and solvents are low VOC or um, low toxics or no toxics. So that is where our concern is. And um, if they're under the threshold for the limit and a rule for the VLC content, they're, they're good. Uh, but if they're not, they're gonna need either after controls or they're gonna need to comply with that. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Rita. Yes, yeah, sorry. I don't mean to go into a cyclical uh, discussion, but I do think it's important to clarify when we say coatings and solvents, uh, the solvent process, uh, that is part of any coating operation would be associated with cleanup, not the actual coating part. That's a separate rule. That's rule 1171. Those cleanup materials are regulated under rule 1171. And it is up to the end user to choose whatever cleanup materials they want to use. Um, it, and so we, we have no control over the cleanup, what a printer is going to use to clean up their press. That's completely separate from the UV process. And one of the things that we've been telling staff is that we should not be penalized for the solvent operations that are being used. Yes, that's part of the overall process at the facility, but not really directly linked to our process. So I don't want those two issues to be conflated. That's a separate rule for clean up solvent. Thank you. Okay, Rita, thank you. Um, I'm looking at um, across the uh, two pages of participants. I don't see any other additional comment. So with that, I'll uh, leave it there and just say I'm really appreciative, Rita, of the information. Also, um, regarding the um, use of the technology related to airborne pathogens. I found that one very uh, compelling. 
as well. So really appreciate you bringing that to everyone's attention today and encouraging to see technology being able to um, be effective at, uh, as was shared uh, today. So we'll move uh, off of item four. Thank you for the presentations today and move on to item five updates on the 2022 state legislative priorities and staff will provide an update on those. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Philip Crabb. I'm a senior public affairs manager uh, working on both state and federal legislation. Um, I just wanted to give a try to do a quick overview of kind of our legislative and budgetary efforts that are part of our 2022 state legislative priorities. Um, the first category is basically those efforts that are seeking air quality related incentive funding. And I'll just go ahead and list uh, some of the items that we're working on. So there's something, uh, AB8 reauthorization is essentially extending the Carl Moyer funding sources. And uh, a key priority there for us is reauthorizing existing Moyer incentive funding received by air districts for deploying cleaner technology for as long as possible. Um, also, we're working on trying to extend AB 617 sustainable incentive funding. Our current budget request is for $500 million for the year. Um, in the past, we have definitely gotten less than that, but we really need to have a push to, to get as much as possible. This is in line with CARB Community Air Protection Incentive Guidelines, where air districts utilize this funding on projects that reduce particulate matter and toxic air contaminant emissions to support SERPs in AB 617 communities. We also have a budget funding request for um, anti-diesel truck funding, um, basically just trying to displace diesel heavy-duty trucks um, with cleaner vehicles. In general, in this case, it's uh, mostly near zero emission trucks or zero emission trucks were commercially viable at scale. Uh, the funding request was for $600 million, and this would be going, funding going to not just South Coast, but also San Joaquin Valley and the Bay Area um, air districts. Um, as kind of a part of that, last year we did receive $45 million uh, for a similar type of request. Um, we are still working on a kind of a budget fix due to the global supply chain disruptions and significant delays in truck deliveries. Uh, we may, may need more time to complete implementation of this project funding, so we're seeking an extension uh, within the state budget. Um, also, there's a bill, the, our independent special district status for air districts bill, which would basically clarify state law to allow local air districts to be considered independent special districts. Uh, there was funding given out for COVID relief uh, to uh, agencies that were designated in that manner, independent special districts for local agencies. Unfortunately, we were not uh, allowed to be considered that and were not eligible for the funding. So this can increase air districts eligibility for future state and federal funding opportunities. Another item uh, that we've been approved for um, is our renewable portfolio standard style uh, standard for air quality. Essentially this proposed bill would create state requirements that could help motivate air quality funding in the budget process by highlighting failures to achieve sufficient annual progress toward attainment of federal standards. This would require annual reporting by CARB regarding their efforts and progress towards attainment of federal standards. Um, also, there was an approved uh, sponsored legislation, which is a goods movement related port cargo fee, and that bill would create a goods movement related port cargo fee that would generate potentially significant amount of air quality related incentive funding that would assist with our efforts to attain federal standards. The amount of the fee in which ports statewide are included in legislation are open for discussion. Um, the second category is kind of our legislative and budgetary efforts that support and highlight local programs and regulatory activity within the South Coast region. Um, one of those items is uh, a $100 million budget request for AB 617 implementation funding, and that's utilized for the extensive implementation efforts for the AB 617 program. Also, as part of that, we have a policy and kind of funding bill regarding uh, some cha policy changes to AB 617, in particular, uh, looking to extend from one year to two years the time to establish a SERP after a community is identified. Also looking to mandate that relevant public agencies beyond air districts and CARB can help develop, implement, and enforce SERPs as needed. Also, the final aspect is a budget item adding funding for administrative costs for community steering committees directly for items like translation, meeting venue costs, meeting coordination, stipends, training, and technical advice for the CSE members. 
Um, there was an item that was just actually approved earlier today, um, and that is another proposed it can be sponsored bill that's for the increased strict liability civil penalties for air quality violations. And this bill would increase strict liability civil penalty ceilings for air quality violations by permitted facilities within South Coast, the South Coast region. The bill would increase penalties to enhance their deterrent effect so we can help reduce toxics and other, other harmful emissions from facilities and protect public health, especially within disadvantaged communities. Um, that item will be awaiting governing board approval next month. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that robust uh, list of items that uh, you're working and monitoring and uh, certainly appreciate uh, all of the efforts and those uh, by my colleagues on the legislative committee. So we'll look forward to uh, other updates on the progress on those multiple fronts. Uh, let me find out if, uh, let's move to any public comment we might have on item Harvey Adder, yeah. Yes, Harvey Adder's hand is up. Okay. And switch to the screen where I can see the... Well, hello. Um, okay. I guess this is in general. Um, the workers are often first ones exposed, workers in communities, primarily workers, the canary in the coal mine expression. So all of these new technology and stuff have to be looked at in terms of, you know, what's gonna happen and you're talking about toxics and solvents, et cetera. Just one thing I'm concerned about is uh, PM like 2.5, it's listed as criteria, but uh, under the Federal Clean Air Act, it was, I don't think it's listed as, as a toxic. And that's got to change. And is it listed for the state? And if not, why not? And uh, that's where the body count is. Um, so, you know, it's it's important. Well, it looks like our um, cumulative clock is um, reached its limit there. Uh, so, staff, is there any clarification we have on? on that uh, matter of the um, the time here today? No. no. Okay. Do we have any other public comment on item five? No other hands raised? Yeah, I, I, I have a, a comment, uh, okay. Mr. Well, Chair. Let, let me hold on a second and I'll just uh, check in. To, there was no further comment from the public. So let me close public comment and I will uh, come back to our, our committee. Uh, please go ahead. Who was um, that was Mr. Lamar? Here. Yeah, Mr. Lamar. Okay, Bill. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that was a, that was a, an, an excellent summation by by Philip. But it was gosh, for me, it was an awful lot to absorb uh, without a handout. Uh, <laughs> is there a, a possibility of of, of, of uh, of, of, of Van or Elaine uh, providing the, the working, the advisory group with, with, with his list of priority, legislative priorities. Uh, that would be my, my one comment. And I see Derek wants his answer. So why don't we do this? We'll forward you the link for a ledge committee. Uh, and I believe it's gonna be on the last two ledge committee meetings. Uh, or if you like, we can just give you the the large the documents you you want which 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 one would you like? Well, I, I, there, there, there were several of them in there. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm primarily I'm concerned about several of them that I could that I jotted down. One was AB six seventeen. The other was uh, uh, the other was about relevant agencies uh, uh, participating in in uh, in the uh, uh, AB six seventeen process. Yeah. And then the third one that I had uh, was on, I guess, AB8, which was, uh, I think that was the number uh, about extending Carl Moyer. And uh, it, it raised a question for me. Uh, I've been involved and am currently involved with, uh, uh, with CARB on their uh, uh, forklift, uh, electric forklift, zero emission forklift program a rule that they're developing. And I was, we had a meeting here just the other day, uh, actually yesterday, as a matter of fact, and uh, talking with their with their staff 
uh, and on the subject of incentives. And uh, they're, they're currently looking at Carl Moyer uh, as a source for, as a resource for incentive monies, as well as their farmer program and, and I think their uh, core program. But uh, I, I don't know, I don't know how the air districts work uh, in relationship to CARB on 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 establishing what is what it, what funding, how much funding is sufficient for all the demands. Uh, Carl Moyer, well, they're all, but especially Carl Moyer is a very valuable program and valued by industry. Uh, but now. Uh, I know the CARB staff estimates that there's some 100,000 forklifts uh, affected by by this by this proposed rule that they're in the process of developing, and many of those are going to. Are, I, I would I would certainly feel confident in saying that the majority of that will be uh, in in the in fall within South Coast jurisdiction here in Southern California as far as their uh, numbers. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's a matter of, it's a matter of is, is there going to be enough money or enough incentive money to go around when these asks go in for, uh, for these various, to fund these various programs. And I would just ask that, you know, or maybe ask is, is, is uh, the district staff considering this proposed rule that uh, the CARB is in the process of developing and will, is supposed to roll out by the end of this year, I think. I think if someone from um, rules can answer that question. Um, Mike, do you know anything? Mike Morris, do you know anything about this? Derek and Susan, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Bill, Bill, you want to repeat it? Because I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, okay. Well, as I was saying, CARB is in the process of, of developing their uh, zero emission forklift uh, rule. Uh, LSI forklift rule, uh, with and those and those affect forklifts with a lift capacity of up to twelve thousand pounds, uh, and they're primarily uh, propane and diesel. Uh, but th uh, they're also estimating that there's some one hundred thousand forklifts uh, in their unit in the universe, and I think that that's probably an undercount. But anyway. Uh, when on the subject of incentive monies, they intended they intend to uh, to tap Carl Moyer, in addition to their farmer program and their core program, uh, as resources for that funding. And I, so I guess my question is, are, does this agency, your agency, as well as some of the other agencies? Uh, uh, coordinate with carbon on this to make sure that when you do ask for increased extension of of, of, uh, of these grant programs and their funding to allow for a major rule like the one carb is 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 is, uh, is putting together. So, so maybe I can take a, a crack at that, uh, Bill. So yeah, Mike, with short is we do coordinate with CARB and I know that our um, technology advancement office does coordinate with them specifically on the issue of the incentive programs and uh, upcoming regulatory developments and how that's all going to mesh. So, um, you know, I don't have specifics for this particular case, but uh, in short, we, you know, we do coordinate fairly extensively with CARB on those issues. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like putting together a, 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 a Christmas list you know, what do you want for Christmas? And, and do you have enough money to, to pay for all these things? And, and that's really what it, what it boils down to because uh, the, 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 sheer, the sheer size of, of this, I, 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 don't, I, I know that CARB doesn't know uh, how much they're, they're talking about. So 
uh, I know this won't happen in one single year, but uh, and it will happen over time. So there'll be uh, various tranches, I guess, of of, uh, of funding. But uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, at least put it on our record as uh, maybe it's something that we should uh, this this uh, advisory group should talk about later in the year. I appreciate that, and we're always. Uh seem to spend a lot of time trying to imbue CARB with a sense of reality in terms of how our incentive programs work. Uh, other, other comments uh, regarding the matters uh, shared today on item five. This is David Rothbart. Um, thank you for the, the presentation, Philip. Uh, and I have similar concerns that uh, Bill just articulated very well. And I was just looking at it more from, uh, you know, an attainment standpoint where, you know, CARB's already said they're not going to chip in the reductions necessary to get the 2023 attainment. And if you go back to the 2016 EQMP, uh, South Coast was indicating that we need, you know, over a billion dollars per year for so many years to get to attainment. So now that CARB is essentially, in my mind, funneling most of the funding for new technology to electric vehicles, it, it doesn't seem as cost effective. You don't get as much bang for your buck in emission reductions. So I'm just kind of curious as far as South Coast stance on when you're gonna fund technology, are you looking at cost effectiveness? And I, I know talking to CARB what, what the position is, but I'm just saying, as far as when South Coast has some ability to get emission reductions, where do you stand as far as only funding uh, electrification vehicles versus what gets you the most bang for the buck? I was just curious, uh, South Coast position. I can answer. Uh, I would say, obviously, we're looking, we're fuel neutral. So we're looking at all the options in terms of that can get us the, the most emission reductions as soonest. So that's part of why we have that $600 million uh, heavy duty anti-diesel truck request. And we would anticipate, you know, a good portion of that, or if not all of it going towards near zero emission heavy duty trucks, just because that technology is more available now. Um, but we definitely work, you know, on trying to develop, you know, the electric zero emission, both vehicles and infrastructure. But I think that we definitely have a, a push for making sure that we can have um, near zero or other technology that are available as sooner rather than later and that are cost effective. Thank I'm you. Like, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. I'm like, we're obviously, we have an obligation to take all feasible um, emission reductions as, as soon as we can. And so part of that is stretching out the incentive funds that are available. So I think we do look to see where we can where we can get the most bang for the buck and near zero uh, vehicles definitely provide that. We also know the importance of promoting zero emission technology, knowing that that is the pathway to the future for us to be able to reach our attainment goals. So I guess the short answer is we do both, but we do keep an eye on, on, on the dollars and how far we can stretch them because we do need to get those emission reductions as soon as we can get them. Thank you. It, it's very helpful to have this discussion. I just know my, my employer, the sanitation districts purchased five heavy duty uh, trucks to evaluate them to see how well they will work. And we're, you know, interested to see the infrastructure necessary. And it's just a progression as far as how do you get to that next step. But it's going to take a long, long time, as you know. And I'm just concerned about CARB's exclusive vision on zero emission and even their definition of near zero excludes what South Coast would deem to be near zero, which is very troubling. So I think we all need to work with, you know, CARB and get them to understand we need the emission reductions as quickly as possible. We're happy to work with you to keep trying to educate them. Thank you, David. Um, just wanting to double check uh, with Paul. Hey, Phil, yeah. Phil, can you hear me? Yes. M my question along with uh, Sarah is on X amount of dollars for reduction, and you you kind of covered it uh, on the back end. Would the emphasis, and so did Sarah, would the emphasis be on uh, on rebuilding and or replacing these gigantic motors, uh, or 
just a loan for a new vehicle. And since AQMDs had a long history of that, what's more cost effective in general? I mean, without being precise, without being precise, what, where, would, where would the direction take you on something like that? Well, I would definitely defer to others on that, but I do know that some of the funding that we're going after and that we have received has been Moyer funding, for example, and that does currently require scrappage of old vehicles. So a lot of times it is replacing vehicles, but I think there are other funding, incentive funding that can you know, repower as well. I don't know if others wanted to add to that. I think if you talk about the difference between, um, you know, a near zero vehicle and a zero emission vehicle, I mean, the near, near zero vehicles are a lot cheaper than the zero emission ones, right? And then you also have the infrastructure challenges associated with the zero emission technology. So from a plain cost effectiveness, just as of today, the near zero vehicles are, are more cost effective by far. Um, so that's where we look to see where we can both, you know, stretch our dollars as well as knowing that those vehicles are commercially available today so that we can get those emission reductions and recognize that today. But we know that our future is a zero emission pathway. We know we have to get down to zero emissions wherever possible in order to be able to attain the standards in the long term. So we have to go on uh, both pathways. And, and that, that I think is something that we, you know, we strive to do. Thank you. Any further comments on item five or any of the uh, matters related to the report? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to other matters. And that brings us to other business. And I don't believe we do any public comment for that because we have public comment period coming up next. So uh, we'll just ask if any member of this body or staff or anyone have any comments or uh, general thoughts. Looks like Mayor Arizmendi has one. Madam Mayor Arizmendi, please. Uh, Chair Mayor Rodriguez, I'm, I'm council member now. So oh, <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> to ask in terms of virtual meetings, I don't know if this has been addressed, are we continuing to meet virtually and or is there an intent to meet in person? Well, you want me to handle that, sir? I think at a, uh, we certainly would, would look forward to some public uh, meetings in person uh, in the foreseeable future. And Derek, feel free to provide any additional comments. Sure, I believe uh, in April, we're more than likely gonna be um, uh, in person, whether it's a hybrid or not, I'm not sure yet. I think Susan, um, if I don't know if we've already determined that, if she's still on the line to answer that portion. So, so we've been, uh, with all the different committee meetings that we've been having, we've been uh, checking in with the, uh, the chair of the committees and the vice chair and uh, other board members that are attending the committees. And uh, so this month, it's, you know, kind of depending on uh, what type of, um, if they're going to be in person or they're going to be remote. Uh, but uh, so we're, you know, kind of easing into uh, still going into hybrid. Uh, and then we still haven't made a decision. It's like, you know, would we stay hybrid or uh, completely in person? I think some meetings, we'll just have to kind of see the logistics of it, uh, but we're uh, definitely easing into uh, more and more hybrid meetings. So you'll be seeing that in the stationary source and tech committee and some other committees that are coming up next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think so we're in transition at this time where some flexibility will still be uh, provided for those who would like to be in person and those who uh, will be continuing to participate virtually. And I, I do believe uh, the sentiment generally has been from the public that they uh, strongly uh, support having any opportunities to participate virtually or by teleconference because of the um, practicality of being able to um, access from home versus getting out in, uh, in public hearings. So 
Okay, uh, any other business that, uh, comments from the group as far as other business? Chair Rodriguez, I see Mr. Edder's hand raised for the general public comment period. Okay, well, we'll move on to item seven, seeing none uh, other uh, comments from uh, the group on other business. Go to seven and we'll proceed with the public comment. Uh, hello, uh, hi, am, am I being heard? Yes, please go right ahead. Thank you. Um, my name's Harvey Etter and I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition. Um, again, as often is the case, an extreme protest to what uh, Dr. Reese was saying about uh, yeah, that it's cost effective for near zero and not for zero. Uh, we came to y'all and it's in the 16 Solar New Deal. Uh, we, we negotiated with the major manufacturers with Tesla and BYD. BYD said they're gonna manufacture 5,000 class eights and they needed eight, 10, 12 months to fit it out, out by uh, 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 Lancaster Pond there where they're making buses, all right? Still going on, okay? You would not help out. There was $63 million in excess fees and what? But you took $20 million and put it like in a, a low-income electric system for some buildings. No policy. What we're doing here was setting up for the two-thirds of the folks, low- and middle-income, that got no increase in income and wealth in the last 40 years as per Piketty, et cetera, equity. Um, that, that would be addressed through a corporation set up with the state and with the private companies, 10%, 10% to the state, the bulk of going to folks that need equity as our democracy does to survive, all right? This was totally put down. Uh, we were told by Dr. Reese, oh, you'll get it later. This is later, okay? Nothing, this would not be the case. We, the 60,000 that's needed for, for big stuff, okay, compared to the 100,000 for these, uh, 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 well, you know, forklifts, all right, okay, this stuff's got to be done. We can manufacture it here. We got to do this stuff. We got to do it now. And, and, and this, this whining and stuff about and supporting natural gas and all this stuff, it, you know, it's self destructive. We've got to phase out. Like yesterday, there was a meeting of cardboard and EJAC, and they said the, 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 uh, the, the fossil fuel manufacturers and the refineries have to be phased out in five years. All right, we put in five year immediate total soil conversion plan coming back 30, 40 years. It's on now. Everybody knows it. And unless we deal with it, you know, like they've got on the side of the MTA buses, uh, to have you not to do from, from, to use power from four to nine, they say, put off doing now what you can do tomorrow. That's self-destructive. That's what our culture's doing. This is big, big stuff, and we got to deal with it now. Okay? That peak's <laughs> valuable, all right? There's total technologies being ignored, solar thermal, all right? There was... 300 gigawatts of solar of, of solar thermal electric in the world and only a battery's 30 all right that's the real world it's totally being ignored and how that comes up and how it's controlled and all this stuff uh, thank you we've reached our total time allotted there and want to say appreciate your comments any other public comment that we have I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the public comment. And uh, that moves us to our adjournment. Our next meeting date will be on Friday, April 8th, 2022 at 11.30 a.m. Uh, we'll look forward to the opportunity to again, have a, a robust discussion. And I do really appreciate uh, everyone's participation and insights, uh, appreciate the presentations today and uh, the various uh, thoughts that were brought out today uh, regarding our legislative package that we're looking at and items. With that, I wanna wish everyone uh, a rest, great rest of the day and wonderful weekend. And we'll look forward to seeing you all in the near future and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good weekend. Thank everybody. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you.